not music. <laughs> For a minute at a time With John and Will And I guess you just rhyme It's Bad Minute Hello and welcome to another week of Bat Minute Returns The podcast where we set a date to look at Tim Burton's 1992 Batman Returns One minute at a time Let's say five Let's say six I am one of the hosts, Niall McGowan. And joining him, as always, of course, it is I, John Parker, someone who is not fond of the early dinner. <laughs> uh, and this week, we're joined by uh, people from a kind of Elseworlds uh, DC Whoa. universe. We have, all the way from the DC Cinematic Minutes, Mark and Nathan. Hello, hello. Hey, how you doing? I've always believed the uh, DC universe is kind of like a multiverse in itself kind of yeah. thing with all the tv shows and movies it, it, they all exist yeah good name drop mm -hmm. but uh yeah we're here today to talk about minute 70 of batman returns which begins with the uh, uh you know alfred kind of doing a bit of uh blocking basically <laughs> i guess we could call it <laughs> with the uh, bruce wayne and ends uh, a minute later with the the penguin about to attack so uh yeah we'll just dig in whenever you guys fancy really yeah, First, he really yeah. does. Like, I mean, block was definitely the, a good, <laughs> the good phrase for it because he so angrily honks that horn, and like you would expect him to hold up like the the, the wrist and like point to the watch, like "Come on, we gotta go." As yeah. if I mean, you're still talking to Bruce Wayne here. I mean, come on, <laughs> he's uh, still technically your boss. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just kind of made me think though, because we've joked in the past about like Alfred been short with Bruce because like he was watching. The t he was watching the Penguin on TV when the Antiques Roadshow was on. It was really like, is there something that matters? Sir? Like, why haven't you changed the channel? This could be like the midweek repeat of Antiques Roadshow is on. It's just like, for the love of God, sir, hurry up. We've only got 10 minutes to get home. It is very like out of character for him, I think, because, I mean, we spent that whole previous film where he was trying to set Bruce up with someone. Yeah. And now mm -hmm. that he's there flirting with someone in front of him, he's like, no, no, come on. <laughs> yeah. We got to yeah. go be Batman. Come on, let's I'm, go. It's like, whoa. I'm glad completely you brought that opposite. Up. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of my notes. But I didn't want to be that guy who like comes in and says, you know, well, how would uh, Alfred do that? Why would why would he? <laughs> well, actually, continuity is wrong in the character. I was like, I was like, why would he obstruct? Uh, you know, he knows who Bruce Wayne is, right? Like, yeah. He knows yeah. deep down that he's like this guy who's been through something so traumatic that he feels it into like this Cape Crusader nonsense, and it's like he wants him to abandon that and be happy. That's what his parents would want, exactly. and it's like. Why are you honking at the guy? He's <laughs> he's obviously interested. He's not just doing this to be Bruce Wayne. Unless it's something where like Alfred doesn't want him hanging out with the cool badass motorcycle Selena Kyle chick, you know? And it's like one of those yes. just old maybe he's old fashioned. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. That's the only explanation I could come up with was he's getting just kind of weird vibes off Selena. He's like, Oh no, 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 no. She's no good for you, sir. Stay away. Stay mm -hmm. away. You look looking like Cruella Deville over here. Yeah, babe. <laughs> oh, oh, don't talk to her. Amazing. She she yeah. hunts down Dalmatians. Don't don't talk to her. <laughs> well, the enemy of the cat. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um. I I mean, what a babe, right? This that outfit right there. That, oh, Alfred that, himself. No. Yeah. Ooh, Alfred, oh, Alfred. Uh, no. Oh, you oh. said the outfit. I'm sorry. I thought you said <laughs> Alfred right there. I will agree to both. Uh, both. Because Alfred. <laughs> Alfred always seems like um, this Alfred. He's always in every film, in all four films, he's always seemed to have like an on point kind of presence. Mm. Like, I don't know. Like, it's it's like his glasses are cool. <laughs> he's got like, I don't know. He's like, his eyebrows are done. And it's like, and then right here, he's got like a little coat. And he's also got a sweet car. Yeah. Hell yeah. That I'm he's sure he takes the, care. the old school, there's probably the same exact bowler hat he had. When we saw him, because like, his driving hat, basically, like every time yeah. Alfred takes out the car, he's got to get on that bowler for some reason. Mm -hmm. There's never been a bad Alfred. <laughs> he's the one consistent thing in these films. Not just, of course, because it's the same actor, but 
even mm-hmm. in the the next two, which aren't as favorably received, let's say, he is great. He's fantastic in all of them. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's like the anti yeah. Pat Hingle in that. Yeah, yeah. Like Pat Hingle's in all of them, but it's just like, oh, what, why though? Like, what's the point of having them here? Whereas this is like, oh, the, oh mm-hmm. great, Alfred's back. <laughs> and no matter how you know different the writing is from one film to the next, uh, you don't notice a difference in his. Like his. You know, and I think it's because the actor is so good at, at delivering his lines mm. that whatever he says is like, whether it be comical or serious, you're like, you're sold on it. You're like, yeah, yeah, you do whatever you want. You want to honk at Bruce Wayne, even though it's <laughs> probably against continuity? I believe you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he probably just came up with it himself on the day. Like, no, this is going in. <laughs> okay, fine. We won't argue with you. I do like the idea, though, that this is a situation where... Alfred and Bruce Wayne went into town together, and it's like, okay, now, so we, we break up, and then you go do your shopping, and I go do my shopping, and then we meet here at this time. <laughs> so mm-hmm. It's like one of those things you do with, like, basically, it is a thing you would do with your kids or something to make sure, like, they don't yeah. stray away too far. And Alfred literally is there, like, oh, he's, he's, he's there talking to some ragamuffin. Nope, nope. Bruce, you come <laughs> over here right now, sir. <laughs> the harlot. <Fun> time's over. <laughs> Just made me meet. Uh, I told you it's strictly at four p.m. to meet under the statue with the big stone ass. <laughs> now he he here Bruce invites Selena over to watch the tree lighting on TV. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that mm-hmm. sounds like a riveting time, doesn't it? No wonder mm. she declines initially. Jesus Christ! I, I like that because we were joking last week too, saying that Bruce was trying to seem cool in front of Selena, because then you know she was like, "Oh, you." She kind of had like a kind of. Are you, are you going to that? And he was like, oh, pff, no, wouldn't be caught dead there. Like he was, you know, that kind of like, <laughs> so you're like, oh, wait, like Oasis or Blur, like oh, Oasis. What? Oh, no, no, I mean, I mean, Blur, I mean, Blur. But this could oh, yeah, be like yeah. him now going like, so do you want to come over to watch the tree lighting? Is a bit like, you know, a teenager listening to like the Spice Girls, ir- ironically or something. <laughs> like Bruce totally wants to watch this tree lighting ceremony, but he can't just su- yeah. say it in front of Selena. So it's like, oh, we, we could watch on TV and like make fun of people and, you know, and like, we'll laugh at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so lame. <laughs> but, yeah. And one of the one of the, uh, you know, one of the things I really like about this moment is you kind of had to like look back at Selena Kyle, how she started in the film. Mm. As a person who was kind of like that, you know, like no one too uh, cool for school. No, she wasn't. Oh. She was yeah, yeah. the opposite. Oh, yeah, she was a complete and, nerdo. And, and it's like here's Bruce Wayne, who who's also kind of nervous and and shy. And it's um, you know, like it. There's like that you know, that piece of advice where it's like you know, if they're not nervous and they're not really into you, because like that for Bruce sense. Wayne to be nervous and into like oh, oh no, I wouldn't. I don't care about that, but. Do you want to watch it on television? You know, like mm-hmm. my place. And, you know, it's like it's one of those things where it's like there's uh, I don't know. You get swept up in the charm of well, there is no charm. That's what's charming about it. Does that make sense? Like the yeah. nervousness. And so she's like she was that, and now someone is actually paying attention to her. And I mean, yeah, it's Bruce Wayne, but it's just the fact that someone is paying attention to her now is finally is, is new to yeah. her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, so and as you say, uh, it's it's interesting. I think it's a shame. It's like sad that she, in her previous guys, let's say the old Selena, mm-hmm. she would genuinely be interested in in this, and they would have. I think they would have got along even better, and you know, maybe maybe they're similar personality. But at the same time, we do constantly say how Bruce isn't really a normal human being who's looking mm-hmm. for a relationship. <laughs> but they seem like very similar people in the past. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I do also have to wonder, and maybe it's only because we made such a big deal of it when we covered the minutes in the first one. Because this, this like, oh, let's say five, let's say six, it immediately harkens back to Bruce Wayne's, like, what, what are we saying? You know, champagne, si- open, what, f- six, six, and then knocks on the, oh, yeah, six, six, six is good. So I can't help but be like, is this a throwback to like Bruce Wayne just loves the number six, apparently? <laughs> Everything with him is six. It's like, I could have gone five, but six is even better. It would have been great, though, if, like, Selena was, like, six is good. And then just did that weird face that Knox does in that scene as well. Mm-hmm. And she's like, wait a minute. No, I don't like you anymore. <laughs> like, uh, you remind me of a guy I once met. <laughs> five, five's too early for me. I'm not an early dinner guy. I, I sometimes don't eat till half eight. Yeah, I, 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 I don't get the late dinner, though, because I, mean, I get it in terms of, like, because 
usually about like 9 p.m. I'll have like a bowl of cereal and then I'll be me for the, the day. <laughs> like that's, you know. <laughs> yeah, but now that it's December, there's daylight savings time. So it gets darker around five. Yeah, so uh, yeah true. Like, oh, it's like, oh, what you by the time you get over to the mansion and, you know, like, you know, by that time, then it'll be dark enough to have a fireplace. Yeah, and watch true. something on television. So maybe he's 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 thinking in his head like it's gonna get dark by five. No, no, six. How, how about six? It'll be the sun will be gone by then for sure. <laughs> I was gonna say I just like the idea of um. <laughs> so Michael Keaton's playing Batman, and the idea of like <laughs> I can think of it just Batman asking a girl out on a date, knowing full well his nightly schedule. Where he's trying to be like, yeah, yeah, come over at five. No, no, six, uh, five, five, six. And it's like, dude, you're like you're going through the mathematics in your head right now. It's like, okay, if she's over at six, we can hang out for a couple hours. Then I got to have enough time to change, shower, prep the car, get Alfred ready. And by the time it's 10 p.m., like all that's going in his mind and it's just comical. Mm. That's 100% right. He's, he's figuring out when he can hit the streets, basically. <laughs> but the, uh, Selena also, because she's already been over with the penguin about like well what's going to happen at this tree lighting ceremony is that they're going to set up batman to quote unquote kill the ice princess so mm-hmm. that, that that's why i actually do like the little switch like we talked about uh, last week about selena kyle's comparisons to Gollum in terms of like this the, the personality switching back and forth and you get a great bit of it here because she is a bit smitten with bruce and then when he's like, let's say five, let's say six, and she kind of like has a genuine smile on her face, like, oh, yeah. And then she, it's like, it's as if the Catwoman personality clicks it back into place and goes, five. Hmm. Because she knows I got to be out of there pretty soon. So I got to yeah. go take part in this whole, you know, turning Batman into a, you know, ruin his reputation and, you know, framing him for this crime and stuff. But, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, so that was, that was actually really well done. I, I like as well the, because not you know, but at this point in the comics, they already well established the fact that Catwoman was much more of an anti-hero, and she was, uh, not, yeah. she wasn't the flat-out villain that she used to be. And of course, nowadays she's mm-hmm. pretty much just like another hero in the books and stuff. But I, I do one of people oh, in the yeah. cinema at the time would have been like, "This is the the potential redemption of Catwoman," where you're seeing, oh, she's hooking up with Bruce, and she seems like she's mellowing out a bit. You might have been inclined to think at the time, like, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe everything's gonna be okay for Selena. Maybe this is the start of her uh, her road to redemption. Yeah. Well, we've already mm-hmm. said multiple times she's not like a, a villain in the normal sense. You kind of sympathize with her, uh, like the things she's been through. She's been mistreated by so many people. So you mm-hmm. you get her, um, and that makes sense. And I suppose the most recent similar example I could think of was when I was first watching, uh, dare I bring this up, The Last Jedi. I don't want to cause an argument on the internet with the listeners, but I was watching that, and I, you think the same with Kylo Ren. There is a minute there where you think to yourself, he, they, they might turn him good. He might, this mm-hmm. might actually go a different way to what I'm thinking here. Yeah, I do. I, I am a sucker for, um, like, when, like I guess, in any character, like, the love interest is their quote-unquote villain, yeah. but they do have that, that there is a, a, a sense of redemption that's, you know coming around in the storyline it's just good storytelling to me um and like it always i, I do kind of always go back to thinking about a Catwoman and batman thing mm-hmm. um is there any other like iconic ones that you're yeah thinking of um you're... mask of the phantasm oh yeah, yeah it's another good one it's yeah. exact same story where she so, goes I mean, on it a is, revenge it's a like, batman yeah. thing <laughs> it's an anti-villain thing well it's a good it, it, like you said it's a good it's a good uh storytelling a good trope to storytelling device because what you mm-hmm. have is, is at least the attempt to redeem someone, um, you know, that that uh, it always requires a lot of sacrifice and mm-hmm. it always it, it always causes an ultimatum. That's why it always works because it's it's foolproof. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, geez. okay, Zeus, just knock that <laughs> yeah. over. No, I especially like it when the, uh, the redemption doesn't work, though. I don't know why. I'm a sick, twisted individual. <laughs> I like it when it, it goes right to the edge, and then they it just makes them worse, if anything. Mm-hmm. See, I've always wanted the opposite. Like in, in that comparison, John, you're making to The Last Jedi, my whole thing was like, I really hope Rey turns evil. I hope that's the arc. They, oh. Just to mix things up. It's like, what if she no, mm. doesn't go evil, but she goes with Kylo Ren, and then that becomes... You're just waiting for the next movie to find out what happens next. It's like, well, what would happen if they decided, like, no, you know what? This black and white evil good thing isn't working anymore. Let's team up and do something yeah. new. 
But then they didn't do that, so. <laughs> well, you could you could have had Batman and Catwoman doing the same thing. Well, well I mean, you do <laughs> in the comics and stuff. You, you and, literally get yeah. the work and go. Yeah, yeah, but in the movie. I mean. <laughs> and that's and I think that's where that's where the conversations usually start to go. Like at some point, we get a sampling of uh, where the audience has to then question who even is on the right side of things. Is Batman on the right side of things? Like trying to get. Selena Kyle on her on his side of things mm. uh, is is that is the love interest actually the one in the right and maybe they're on the wrong side or does is is both sides wrong and then maybe there's something more gray in the middle that both have to abandon and reach like a common uh, a new common ground and and I think that's something where I'm hoping with those future Star Wars films that you know both uh let things go like both of them are like hey uh what i'm doing isn't perfect and what you're doing isn't perfect and there's something that we could be working towards together that's that's a lot better um but you know like with this film you know by the end of it, it it is kind of like a cut the cord kind of thing like it didn't work i couldn't save her kind of thing yeah and that and that i understand john why why you find that so great because that that is the more honest route where mm-hmm. people go down those those tragedies, yeah. those Shakespearean tragedies. Oh, very Shakespearean, actually. <laughs> yes, perfect example. Well, do actually in, in that same vein though, I like the the music in this because you actually it's like the one bit of like light music you get in this whole movie, where like the the score kind of goes into like a really pleasant like a uh, couple of notes. I was like, oh, yeah, maybe, oh, they've made this date. Maybe, oh, you never know. Like, maybe Batman and Catwoman can get together and be happy. And then, because that's you know, two seconds, and then it goes into like this sinister tone <laughs> when it's cut into like, the Ice Princess's tent and stuff. But um, yeah. Speaking of the Ice Princess, though, like she is in the background oh. of this whole scene, uh, just in the corner, sort of, I guess, going over what, you know, you know so she has to light this tree. Like, that's... Yeah. She's on the stage. She's back, folks. She's back. The Ice Princess is back. But yeah, she's, you just see her kind of looking a little bit exasperated as people are going over the... And she's in costume already. Like, this is what, like two in the afternoon, I guess? And she's already dressed no, up. it's later now. It's dark now. No, no, I mean, like, in. I'm talking about in the background, in when Selena yeah, and Bruce yeah, yeah. are making oh, the Oh, I see what you mean. Sorry, I thought you were talking about the next scene. I apologize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she is in costume in the background there, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, usually they would just be in like in like uh, windbreakers or like whatever they're like windbreakers. Yeah, you know, yeah. like uh, when <laughs> what is it like you know when like a dance team has like their away jackets. And oh, stuff. you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. They're like their you know warm up jackets and that's what they're called warm up jackets. God, what are they called? The Rockettes. Yeah, there sure. You go. Uh, and so like it was just, you would just be rehearsing in that it's like why why are you dolled up ready to go people are going to think you're doing the show now and yeah. it's like <laughs> passes by surely you're supposed to surprise people with that outfit later <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I guess they, uh, they, they already just... did see a, a Christmas tree lighting so it's like unless they come out and she's dolled up like friggin a completely new outfit like she appears like like Skeletor when he becomes master of the universe in the 87 movies. It was a giant friggin' gold crown that covers her whole face and stuff. Mm. I was like, oh, we've done even better this one. <laughs> oh, I would have loved that. I do actually uh, love it in the original script as well. And I guess I, I can understand why they cut it because it's a bit too cartoony. But they specifically point out that the Ice Princess is in the background and the people advising her on how to do the thing are the Penguin's men. Like, they're already there t- telling her what she's supposed to be doing and stuff. Which, again, is like, oh, that's a nice little bit of ominousness. But at the same time, it's like, well, why would they be there? Like, why wouldn't there be officials setting up this Christmas tree with her going, like, well, this is what you do. Why would they have random... Why would the organ grinder be there instructing her and his, with his monkey and stuff? It wouldn't make much sense. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. Like, I do... It's so weird. I do, like, I like the idea of it. It had to been... Actually, you know, once we get into this next scene as well, there's a whole lot of questions about the the penguin's practices in abducting this woman because they're all very strange mm-hmm. to me. Yeah, I mean, I think, and it's unfortunate, but I don't think she's the brightest person. So <laughs> maybe that's why she's just listening. She, oh, okay, sure, yeah, you know, and just going taking any anyone and you know anyone's advice on it, and it's 
it's a lot of things about her situation I'm curious about because she's also got like this, you know, kind of uh, makeshift tent for her, for her like the circus tent, the fumigated house. That's what. Here's yeah. the thing. Yeah, it's fumigate. It's cold out, and you're in a tent. It's <laughs> tarp, <cold. laughs> and Dressed it's like, like she that. doesn't have any jacket or nothing. It's like set up. It's like this whole tent has everything. It's got a whole like. Look at all like, this Like, I stuff. feel miserably cold just looking at that tent. <laughs> Imagine her inside there. She seems quite Like, you're going to tell me it's actually warm? <laughs> oh. She could be surrounded by, like, little space heaters or something. You never know. Maybe she's... It's got to be. I hope there's so. so much, there's so much steam coming. Like, when Penguin and... Uh, who's, who's this lady? Uh, I think she's just credited as Poodle Lady. Okay. Yep. Poodle Lady, <laughs> our favorite. <laughs> Uh, when when sh- they walk in, there's just like a big thick cloud of of smoke. yeah. Well, steam has always been um the main antagonist in every movie. <laughs> so you know you you gotta have your steam five minutes of fame in this yeah. one. It's gotta be steam st- is the real ominous uh you know villain. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> steam everywhere. More please, not enough. I will say though because all it, the steam. The thing is like. You were talking about like, oh, she doesn't seem like the brightest woman. And we covered way back at the start when she's introduced uh, the Batman, the, the Batman wiki specifies like, oh, she may. I think they said that she may be the city's dumbest person. And we we're like, that's a bit yeah, harsh. Yeah, yeah, dimmest. And the thing is, we like we said that in there. And then we got an email from someone a while later going like, yeah, I might have been the person who wrote that on the Wikipedia. Uh-huh. And he had a very <laughs> the, the fans were like, well, look at what happens in this scene. Like. Everyone knows who the penguin is, but she has no idea. He comes in, says he's a town scout, and she instantly is like, okay, I believe this. Where he looks like the shiftiest yeah. man alive, who's also been <laughs> all over the newspapers recently. How does she not know who he is? Oh, I was going to bring that up. I thought that was a great sort of piece for a character. Um, the, the fact that she doesn't recognize him. Because she does see him exactly like the kind of person who would pay absolutely no attention to the news. She doesn't know who's running for mayor. Yeah. She probably doesn't mm-hmm. even know who the mayor is. Like, why is this relevant? I don't know. It's just that guy who stood near me when I pressed a button. <laughs> Whatever. It's super relevant today. I mean, how many people are just like, oh, I did Like, they don't even, they're not even aware of the current connected. situation. Is she supposed to be uh, compared to like a real life person? Um, in the, Like, is she supposed to be like a Marilyn Monroe Kind of Pamela, Anderson. Pamela. No, not Pamela Anderson. I think it'd be too. You can you get a kind of Pamela Anderson vibe, but I think it'd be probably too early. Like she wouldn't have been quite yeah. that big a star just at, at, in ninety two, mm-hmm. probably. I don't know. Maybe on the cusp. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But that's, I think she is supposed to be just like a, a caricature of your general beauty queen, the kind of perceived mm-hmm. airheadedness of like people who are just just there to look good rather than that don't actually provide anything. They're just. Like a, a, okay. like a a pretty figure, basically. Uh, the thing is, though, well, is, is the actress is is the actress anything? In, is she important at all? No, like, no, she didn't really do. I've never seen her. Christy Conway. No, yeah. she didn't do much. She's, mm-hmm. uh, although, yeah. interesting enough, I, I the thing is, there's a lot made in the script trying to indicate that the ice the ice princess is a bit more of a kind of an asshole than. Yeah, and the, yeah. I think in the novelization they say yeah. during the the riot she's supposed to like push down an old woman to get her out of the way and stuff, and then even in mm-hmm. uh, there's an interview from Entertainment Weekly with Chris uh, Christy Conaway where she said like uh, she described her character as the type to push down an old lady while trying to fix her nail at the same time. The thing is like in in the scenes and stuff, where the Ice Princess seems like okay, she seems like a nice enough person. I don't, I, I yeah. didn't get the idea that she was yeah. like, she was supposed to be like a, a total asshole or anything. Yeah, that was actually one of my notes because I was gonna say like uh, that she's not uh, where I was saying she's not really like the brightest, unfortunately. <laughs> and I was gonna add that she it doesn't re- it's not really like warranted. Like she's not. It's just, I was gonna say she's not like a. She didn't do anything wrong. Like, she no. seems like a nice person. She's just not the brightest. And then once you said that, I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of, I guess that's what I was missing is like, usually there's something like, oh, something bad is going to happen to you. And I'm not going to be sad about it because it's like, maybe you kind of had it coming. Yeah. I wonder if they couldn't figure out the middle ground between keeping her like real mean assholey versus being dim. 
Just, and it's like they had to be like, okay, gotta be more diva. Bring that's up all. The di- that's what I was trying to go for. Yeah. Maybe yeah. there was supposed to like she was supposed to be like extra diva. Yeah. So like pushing the old woman down, fixing her nails, like get out of my way. Where's the camera? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> just <laughs> be more like like. But then you can't really back that up with being dim, like a blank. Yeah, you super can. dim, but like <laughs> really, really dim. You know what I mean? Not knowing who the penguin is, kind of thing. <laughs> um, not seeing that someone is cocking their hand back, about to throw something at you. <laughs> She seems really nice, and it almost seems like unfortunate. Where it's like, oh, yeah, you're not the brightest, but I feel bad for you. <laughs> I do love this thing on the wiki again. I, I do hate to just read off a wiki, but it it ties into all this. You know, we're calling it we're calling a dim again, basically, um, because there's another bit that I never read last time, where it, it says it is not known how someone as stupid as the Ice Princess. <laughs> who apparently struggled with the simple mental task of figuring out the order for lighting a Christmas tree, was awarded with her title. But there are a couple of possibilities. And then it just decides it's going to make up possibilities. Maybe (laughs) the Ice Princess was having a relationship with the mayor. (laughs) (laughs) That's a a bit mean. You can't say that about people. Come on. (laughs) Who's this guy think think he is? Us? We're the only people around to speculate on. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's, they know you're reading it, so they're like changing it all up. This on is you. their five minutes of fame. <gasps> they're reading my stuff. They're reading so they, my yeah, stuff. We can't get a guest spot. Just write loads of stuff on the wiki that we'll read out. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick. <laughs> yeah, they figured it out. But uh, 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 one thing I do have to ask as well is that uh, before the penguin comes in, we get like a little shot of her. You know, she's sitting. Try. You see, she actually just has simp- three lines written on this page that she's going over and over again. But there's a thing on the table. Or on the chair next to her. I have no idea what this thing is. It looks like a long wooden cage with kind of spikes at the top around the the ridges. What the hell is that? What is it for? Oh yeah. Uh, what is it? It's just, it's in the it's in the far left that? far left corner. Go back, Mark. Yeah, it's just just as he's oh. like uh, looking at herself in the mirror. The, it could be a trophy, like a, or is it a? It's like a wood sculpture. Oh. Is it something you'd maybe maybe put like uh, a candle in? Oh I yeah, I was thinking like a <laughs> oh, wooden like what if a, wo- it's a heater. I think it's a heater. No, well, that oh, could be the heater. Here we go. That would make sense. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's the heater. I wouldn't put it on a chair, but they seem yeah, to have. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> hey, not the brightest. Okay, not the brightest. <laughs> she's, she's the dimmest <laughs> bulb. Yeah. It said on the. Or it's either that or some sort. I don't. She's. I even, was thinking it was like. <laughs> she's like even a, got a phone, like a landline. I phone. thought it was like a case to put a wig in. <laughs> No, that's a phone. That's... No, I never thought the phone, the <laughs> box, the the wooden box thing. I didn't know if it was like a beauty thing or like something that actresses carry around, like a makeup box. But it doesn't. It, it no, it doesn't look like one. It's a space heater. It's a space heater. That's a space totally. heater. Yep, mm-hmm. that's yeah, a heater. It looks like a radiator. <laughs> so, so now we're getting the Wikipedia. It's not known what kind of an idiot would put a, a heater on a chair. <laughs> Yeah, Ooh. can we put that in there? Let's add that to her dimness. She put a space heater on a fabric chair. <laughs> and then next to her fur coat yeah. right behind it. <laughs> That'll be something, though, like the t- this led to the tent burning down. And then everyone, the penguins, mm. waiting, like, no one's reporting this kidnapping. It's like, the ice princess has died in a fire. I'm like, oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah. She caused a great Chicago fire. <laughs> Ooh. It was her. Ooh, that's actually a good uh, a good segue into a, a thing I've been waiting to bring up for a while, actually. Because I was... Her beautiful tan. No, no, it's uh, <laughs> one of the... Uh, we've talked, you know, about several uh, influences of this version of the Penguin, like a few weeks back with Kerry Halligan. We were talking about the Richard III connection, that DeVito saw a lot of that character in it. And we talked quite a bit uh, a few weeks back about the character of Dr. Caligari from The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and how he influenced nice. the appearance of the Penguin. But there's a pretty big one that Tim Burton himself has said, like, yep, this is one of the visual influences. And it's actually, like, how the, how much this ties into Batman, and it seems to be so underreported, is crazy to me. Uh, because he does also bear a distinct uh, comparison to Lon Chaney's villain character from uh, London After Midnight, which is a 1927 silent movie, which has been, since been completely lost, because uh, the last known mm-hmm. copy was burned up in a fire, actually. <laughs> it was in the MGM vault fire in 1965. But uh, basically, mm. yeah, the, 
It was a movie by Todd Browning, who directed Freaks, obviously as well, and Dracula, both films we've talked about influencing Tim Burton and his version of Batman in particular. But uh, if you look in the plot summary, particularly in this scene, and it might be why I waited for this scene to bring it up, uh, they describe a bit of the plot. It says uh, there's a person who is found dead, and it's presumed to be through a gunshot wound, but it's a bit a self-inflicted gunshot wound, but it looks a bit uh, mysterious. And then it says... Five years later, with the case still unresolved, a sinister-looking man with pointed teeth wearing a beaver-skin top hat arrives at the household accompanied by a cadaverous-looking woman in a long gown. I'm like, huh, Ooh. that looks a bit familiar to this scene, doesn't it? <laughs> uh-huh. and, uh, yeah, if you see, that's the thing, though. Uh, throughout the rest of the movie, it basically comes out that Lon Chaney, who's playing the detective and the villain, uh, he is you know two separate characters. And uh, it comes out at the end, he's actually like a vampire, pretty much. And they actually remade the movie. Todd Browning himself remade the movie with Bella Lugosi a couple of years later. But he's just in the kind of Dracula outfit he usually has. But the thing is, yeah, if you look at Long <laughs> mm-hmm. Chaney, you know, he's, got, he's got the same top hat. He's got the long hair come out, the, and he's got the kind of same outfit. Well, another thing he has is that when he lifts his arms, he's got a cape mm-hmm. that looks very distinctly like bat wings. Very much like Batman's mm-hmm. cape. Yeah. And throughout the rest of it, he's also got this fixed rictus grin that looks incredibly like the Jack Nicholson Joker's rictus grin. So I, I imagine, because the, the last known company copy disappeared in 1965 in this fire, it's a good chance Tim Burton has seen, he probably saw the movie before that because he's a lot older than that. And he may well, have, you know, he has admitted that it, it uh, London After Midnight did influence the Penguin. I'd say it influenced yeah. his entire look at Gotham pretty much because it seems to be a lot of different things he took. Because um, even the uh, Luna, the girl that this villainous character appears with, uh, she's described in the synopsis as a bat girl. So there's one thing. And she does seem to be very, very similar to the poodle lady, like just in her attitude and the way she acts and stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, this is a really... The thing is, you I think they've re-released... You can get stills and a sort of script synopsis versions of the movie because it's quite short. But that's available. Mm-hmm. But apparently, like, the film now is so rare that uh, I think even its original poster is the most expensive thing... It's the most expensive movie poster ever sold at auction. So it was sold to an anonymous bidder for $478,000. A couple of years back. To Tim Burton. Could, I think it potentially could have been to Tim Burton, actually. <laughs> Probably. Let's be honest. But, uh, and you were saying the, the copies of this movie were burnt up in the Chicago fire? No, no, no. They were. Uh, There's an MGM oh. vault fire <laughs> in 65. Oh, <laughs> MGM vault okay. fire. Okay. In I the was Gotham like, whoa. Tent fire. <laughs> Maybe uh, the MGM vault fire? Hmm. <laughs> trying to think. That's not Phantom of the Opera, right? That's not... No. <laughs> there's, there's a... Universal Studios has a, um, they have a, a studio that is like haunted, which everyone filmed Phantom of the Opera, like that actual oh, soundstage. Oh, you believe that? <laughs> yeah. I thought that was just like a little, like a just a tall tale. Oh, the Phantom of the Opera soundstage is haunted because it's haunted with the Phantom of the Opera. Of course it is. Sure, Nate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe, you know, sure. If that's what it is, then go for it. But... Not that the actual Phantom of the Opera just said it's haunted, but they filmed that film there. No, that's it's him. It's the Phantom. Yeah, it's they the saw that they saw it. They were they were off Broadway and they were like, "This guy." It's actually the Phantom of the Cineplex. Oh, oh, <laughs> the long-awaited sequel. Yeah, <laughs> I think they did make a sequel a couple of years. It was Love Never Dies? It was. Like, it awful. No, Phantom of the Cineplex was like a Disney Channel movie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, it wouldn't surprise me if they did it. They just did another Mary Poppins after all this time, so who knows? I think, yeah, even the sharp teeth on uh, Lou Cheney's, uh the um, London After Midnight, like the sharp teeth is like, okay, yeah, because uh, Penguin has quite a few of those moments of like animalistic behavior, and it's like, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, you're literally biting a guy's nose at one point. Oh, no, I was just going to say to you guys, because you know you're obviously covering... Uh, DC, DC movies that have introduced quite a few characters already, but I think there's there's rumors of it, it, this the Batman. I don't know if that'll still be in mm-hmm. your in your wheelhouse. Would you be covering that? Because that seems to, there's rumors about that the Penguin will be appearing in that, but that will be the first we've seen of a big screen Penguin in nearly thirty odd years, pretty much. So 
would you um what, what what do you guys think of this version of the penguin and would you like any elements of it to carry over into the current dc verse or would you like it to be like no back to the comic drawing board of guy with long nose and monocle and stuff <laughs> i think it's hard to not step away from danny devito's rendition of like you kind of i feel like that nah. I might be biased. I just really like this character in this movie. Um, yeah. And it just seems like something that should just be a staple. You should always just call back to. Because, I mean, it, you, you already have a character playing on screen doing it. Um, it just seems like you should take note of it and say, okay, this is what they did. Let's not mimic it, but, you know, find the middle ground and, and take some elements from DeVito's Penguin and, and move them on to the more modern one. I mean, yeah, we're losing the... <laughs> theatricalness in mm-hmm. these comic book movies like what tim burton was so v- very good at um mm-hmm. so it seems like uh, maybe a newer penguin would be just like a dark creepy weirdo ped- pedophile <laughs> or something like. it's it's um it's it's gonna it would always be very hard to get anywhere close to this because mm-hmm. As much as people might say, like, oh, Danny DeVito's Penguin is my favorite. Of- but even, like, Tom Kenny in The Batman, like, it was really, I, I think that's, like, a cartoon version of Danny DeVito's Penguin. Yeah. But it, it, it always, more so than being Danny DeVito's Penguin, it is Tim Burton's Penguin. Yeah. Like, Tim oh. Burton, you know, he he is the kind of guy to go, well, what if he was, like... So, what if uh, he was actually half a penguin? What if he was so um, <laughs> amalgamated that he looked and had the features of a penguin, mm-hmm. and like it freaked people out, like a circus freak? Circus freak was like the every everything is a circus freak in in Tim Burton's Batman. Like, yeah, like that's that's time. what it is, and so like that's Tim Burton, and it's so and so like. For a filmmaker who, you know, let's say Matt Reeves, and it's like Matt Reeves has his own filmmaking, his own artistry. He is an artist in his own way, mm-hmm. and it's like. He can't. He can't go and just do Tim Burton. He has to go and do Matt Reeves, and so it's it's yeah. hard to to get that close to Danny DeVito's Penguin, because then you're just you're just rehashing. You're just Tim trying Burton. to emulate. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, when uh, given the current U.S. political things since 2016, there have been uh, some parallels between the political uh events that happen in this film in batman returns and uh <laughs> oh, yeah. and people, real life in real life Very and similar. so i do think that the next penguin that we see uh whether it be a matt reeves film or just anything when we get a, a penguin who's kind of got gotham by his grip i think we're going to see a strong parallel between how that penguin is written and uh, the current president of the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> I would be on board with that, though, because I, I think you're right. Like, how do you move forward with the character now? You can't just copy this. Yeah. It's but easy then, money. Uh, yeah, yeah. How do you, though, make him interesting? Because this is so out there and so wacky and so wild. If you then revert back to uh, he's just like a gangster. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or just a posh guy with an umbrella. It, and a big nose it, it doesn't seem the same so that's about the only way you could maybe take it is is your suggestion mm-hmm. yeah and people want to see that kind of thing you know like when, once you start to connect um real life with you know the comic books that's just how it always it's like like i said it's easy money it's like it's ripe for picking and so people will look at today's current political stuff and the political climate and they'll go you know, oh, if only, you know, Batman was here to, like, have no jurisdiction and, and to, like, execute justice in, in ways that we have no control over. That's one of those things where you get the movie where it's like, oh, Penguin is, like, such and such person, except Batman's here and he can actually do something about it. Mm. There you go. What's the uh, what's the reception on this Penguin in that Gotham show? Is, he, is it good? Do fans like that version? And what's the difference between... Uh, this younger one and a Danny DeVito guy is he like he's more gangster, right? Like yeah, crime boss, gangster. Yeah, he's a not businessman. A lot of people like him. Like I, mm-hmm. I'm not a big fan of the show, but he is the best thing in it to me. He he plays mm-hmm. it well, um, and he's he's weird enough for it still to be interesting. He's not just out and out. He's a gangster. Like he's he's a quirky character. He's very strange. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The whole show is strange, and I, I feel like I have to like almost applaud it for being it's Batman. It's staying in its yeah. It, it's it's that show really stuck to its guns in, oh, in yeah. the sense of like it didn't it didn't shift against the criticism. It continued to be this strange divergence of what we normally know from the Batman universe, and so Penguin's character is. Uh, almost an anti-hero where he uh he was affiliated with with gangster lifestyle and like that you know that's what his you know his daily life was um but then it quickly turned into a revenge plot where his mother was somehow uh a victim of of it and yeah. so he climbs this kingpin ladder and then it's all because he's just extremely mad at everyone else who works in that in that organization i don't know it's very bizarre so you end up enjoying him and then um they they do a really great thing where they him and riddler have a really good dynamic together Mm -hmm. and you guys really people really so much that people think that they're into each other welcome back to gotham minute (laughs) no (laughs) give it a shot by the end uh, i saw the uh the last season i didn't uh i didn't watch all of it but i did watch the last the latest season and i was okay. by the end of it i was like okay you have my attention mm. <laughs> i think it's one of those yeah you kind of just unless you back out early like like i did you, you're hooked mm-hmm. whether you whether it's good or not is irrelevant <laughs> it's like you just have to keep watching because it is bizarre mm-hmm. i saw like after i stopped watching it i saw there was a bit where fish mooney takes her eye out with a spoon Mm-hmm. <laughs> her own mm-hmm. eyeball which was like what the hell is this show turning into it, it sounds great though I, I, I might go back and see if i can get back into it again <laughs> yeah i think it, i think that's what they were doing they were just like okay everyone thinks it's you know that <laughs> crazy let's just keep doing that and so you get a <laughs> lot of those moments uh where it was just like i don't even know what's going on anymore and that's what they love about it so <laughs> um what is what is what is the the batarang that the dog has? What well, is that the, thing? Uh, the remote control batarang you might recall from the Arkham games. The insanity-inducing mm-hmm. remote control batarang seems to have been influenced uh. by this thing. That, that's the thing. That was another thing, though, in the Ice Princess wiki, where they're talking about like, oh, she's so stupid, she can't. She mistakes that for a camera. The thing is, nowadays, if you saw that, and someone told you that was a camera, you'd be like, okay, sure, looks. I've seen I've yeah. seen weirder cameras than that. I guess <laughs> even back then, like I would've been like, okay, well, this guy, yeah, if he's if he's a, a talent scout, he's, maybe he's got a really fancy camera. I didn't hold that against her. I thought that was you know totally no okay. But plus, what other explanation is there? What would she think that is? <laughs> Who's seen a remote control like, batarang in their day to day? Coming in, like, wait a minute, that looks like a remote control <laughs> batarang that you're gonna throw at my head. <laughs> I love the way that the poodle still has that from when it caught it <laughs> all those minutes ago. <laughs> well, it seems like, yeah, the penguin has to probably really yank it out of its jaws. <laughs> yeah, like it almost looks like a dog toy. Like that's what I would think it is. Because it's, yeah. like, it's like, what is that? Like it's it's so like thick. It almost looks like foam with like a little piece of duct tape on it. And it's like, <laughs> what is that flimsy yeah, thing? It's not the best looking prop we've seen in this movie, I'll be honest. It, it, when you saw it earlier, it looked great. For some reason here, it looks really cheap. It's like the Gillette razor from the Phantom Menace of yeah. Batman <laughs> Returns. <laughs> well, that's the, the big question that to me, though, is why is the Penguin doing this himself? Like, surely as a high-profile picture, a high-profile person around Gotham who's in all the papers, who's running for mayor, he's got, you know, at least a dozen underlings. Any one of them could come and get the Ice Princess, but he himself has to show up. I don't understand why. Like, why couldn't they have got the organ grinder to do it? Or why couldn't they, the poodle lady could have just done it herself? Yeah. Or the poodle. Yeah, because it would have been good, actually, if they had, like, the poodle successfully kidnapped the ice princess Mm -hmm. by itself. (gasps) Oh, that'd be amazing. And you see it dragging her away while she's unconscious. Like, (laughs) Yeah. Or, like, leaves a trail of, I don't know, like, lipsticks or something, or something the ice princess would be interested in. (laughs) Into, like, an open manhole cover, and it just trips her, and she falls in. Yes. I mean, it's a remote battering. Why not just use her remotely? He doesn't have the remote. 
I thought it seemed like it didn't. It was remote controlled, but then when we saw Batman using it earlier, he just kind of presses a few buttons at the bottom of it, and it just does everything itself. Oh. So yeah, I think it's like pre-programmed. It can like uh, home in on people somehow. That's maybe it's like the batteries just ran out or something. It looks like it's pretty dead for what it is now. But oh, you know what? I think that yeah, that's that makes sense because the the screen looks totally different now to what it did before. Mm. Maybe it's not just a cheap prop. It's supposed to have run out of battery. <laughs> yeah. Well, good news is you can still use it as a normal batarang. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now it's just heavier. Yeah. <laughs> Take it's out like the when batteries. you run out of bullets with a gun and you just throw with a gun. <laughs> so yeah. Like, yeah. It still works as a weapon. We've, we've all done it. <laughs> we've all done that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, of course, so uh, the Ice Princess begins to pose for... You know, for the picture, she's presuming this talent scout is going to take over. Uh, I do love that she seems to be very consistent with this friggin' pose. Like, she did that at the beginning. This seems to be the Ice Princess's, like, yep, the the one arm raised, armpit exposed. This is the pose of, maybe this won her, the, the coveted position of Ice Princess. Hey, everyone has exact. a pose, you know, that you've got to have a look. Zoolander. <laughs> well, he's, got, he's got a couple, to be fair, but he's working on the ultimate one. Uh, you know, uh, RuPaul on uh, Drag Race has a, this exact pose that he does every single episode, <laughs> at least so twice. You're saying, you're saying RuPaul's ripping off the Ice Princess. <laughs> Ooh. Well, it's not quite this. It's almost this. It's very <laughs> similar. Get, get it on to uh, <laughs> the, the official RuPaul Twitter account going, yeah. we, we're on to you. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Ru, Ru's been on the go longer than the Ice Princess. <laughs> That'd be great though if we just we just sent him a thanks saying we're on to you and he sees us from Bat Minute and like beads of sweat appear in his forehead and he's just like yeah. <laughs> it's caught up with me finally <laughs> <That one's laughs> like, I've just been ripping off the Ice Princess all these years uh, I get a cease and desist letter from his company oh jeez <laughs> I was like there's only one way out of this Rue you're mm. gonna have to come on the show <laughs> <laughs> he does have a podcast so <laughs> he might Her do side. it first time they watched batman returns and they had an epiphany they were like that's be, it be so good <laughs> that they want to kill you yeah. <laughs> yes oh, and that was God. the takeaway <laughs> and who can aspire to more yeah. but uh but i think that's all was really for this minute yeah you guys you have anything else no you my, my last note was just you know, it's just, it just doesn't deserve it just feel bad for her <laughs> it's like oh yeah. poor thing <laughs> Just because she's apparently stupid, it doesn't mean she deserves this. But the thing is, though, in, in terms of talk, like, the the original script, though, actually, fun thing we should mention, just to reinforce the fact that, you know, the Ice Princess seems pretty nice here. She does have this, like, who are you? Like, that that would be the only line where she'd seem a bit off. But at the same time, someone's just bars into her tent, so, and she's yeah. quite stressed. But then the original script, the, the original Dan Waters draft... You know, they make it very blatant that she's not a nice person, and she's at this point in the in that she's supposed to be on the phone saying, uh, "Yeah, yeah, that's all very uninteresting." Bottom line, they want this fair maiden back next year. They're going to have to pay big time. I don't want to be pressing a sucky red button all my life. So that is kind of like you can see there's a bit more diva about her, mm-hmm. a yeah. bit more sassiness, a bit more like yeah, she's not the most pleasant person. But the, the, for some reason, whatever reason, it was all chipped away. Until we got like, oh, this poor woman's been abducted by the penguin now. But yeah, that's all I got for this minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. That's all I've got too. So before we head off into the dark, dark night, would our wonderful guests like to tell our listeners where they can be found online? Yeah, uh, we do uh, another DC podcast it's called DC Cinematic Minute. You can find that on all social media at DCEU Minute. And you can listen to us. We've done 143 episodes on Man of Steel, uh, 187 episodes on Dawn of Justice, and now we are currently analyzing the film Suicide Squad. And you can find that on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, everything. And uh, yeah. yeah. Make sure to check it out, everybody. I'm sure you'll like it. Um, and, you know, even if... Say, like me, you don't think Suicide Squad is the best movie. It still makes a great listen, which is oh, yeah. which is all that matters, really. <laughs> Sometimes I love listening to shows about movies I'm not that into. It makes them better. 
it's it's interesting because um and i think we should like let people know i guess i don't do this enough but like i think a lot of times people think our show is either uh strictly against those films or strictly like for those films uh we don't do either one i mean we love the dc cinematic universe like the current films like we're huge fans of it but uh we do have guests who don't like the films at all or we do have fans who love the films so it's like it's a mixed bag, and I think that's the best thing to do is always invite and welcome everyone's opinions, and that keeps the show from being like, uh, uh, Nate, you said, like a soapbox for people's yeah. uh, fandom, mm-hmm. and yeah. so we, so it's a very zen, balanced podcast. Yeah, that's, that's the best thing about it, I think. You don't, you don't want to be coming and just uh, sort of putting everyone off by shouting, I love this, or I hate this. There's nothing, mm-hmm. nothing more irritating. You just present, present your case. In a, in a nice manner and it's good i like it it's fun everybody listen to that if you haven't already i'm sure you probably have and uh join us on facebook at the bat minute listeners cave or on twitter at bat minute and you know review us on itunes give us five stars go on go on go on go on i'll i'll, I'll uh praise you on air if you do that go on do it do it do it <laughs> and join us again on wednesday we'll be back for more bat minute returns next time cutting the cheese A perilous projectile is pitched astray as the reprobate penguin pecks his prey. But as a table is set for some vigilantism vets, will any ice break during their tense tete-a-tete? Find out Wednesday. Same bat pod, different bat minutes.